All right, has everybody turned in their homework? Question four. Um, we did A yesterday, right? So let's look at B. So convertible is a fun card to drive. So what are some propositions we can use to work this? We say, for example, P is a convertible car and Q is a fun to drive car. The statement becomes in P and Q. Sounds good. So P can be the proposition that a given car is a convertible, and Q can be the proposition that a given car is fun to drive. So this statement here is saying if a car is a convertible, then it's fun to drive. And this proposition is saying that a given car is not a convertible, and we're asked to conclude that a given car is not fun to drive. And the question is, is this logical? No. Mm. Why not? Which fallacy? This is the fallacy of denying the hypothesis. Right, John might drive a non-convertible Tesla. Do you have homework to turn in? Yes. Attack of the bacon eating dogs. Yeah. All right. Propositions. Mary likes all good movies. 
That is a proposition, but it's not going to, if we just call this P, we're going to have a hard time relating it to anything. Should I do that? Did you? Yeah, I did, and I said, like, if, uh, maybe my likes also are not good, not good movies, which is a difference. Murray likes not good movies? Also. Okay, so Q. Murray likes bad movies? Yes. Okay. Where do we go from there, though? So Q may uh, show the third one, while P is not part of that. Mm -hmm. P is not the main reason, Q is the reason. Okay, but we don't know if Q is true or not. Could be true or false. Could be true or false. And this is how Mary likes the back of it's, and, yeah, it's, and the thing is that it's independent than P. Mm -hmm. Right, and because it's independent, I don't know how to link those together. But if we can find two propositions in that first. If it's a good movie, really likes it. Yeah, so let's try this. <coughs> P could be a movie is good, and Q is Mary likes a particular movie. And so this statement is saying, if a movie is good, then Mary likes it. That's the same thing as saying Mary likes all good movies. And then Mary likes Attack of the Lizard People. That's saying Q. And then we're asked to conclude that P must follow. The question is, is that true or not? Yes. That's actually another fallacy. That's the fallacy of affirming the conclusion. Right? If you're a dog, you like bacon. I like bacon, but I'm not a dog. So, fallacy of affirming the conclusion. Because as you said, Mary like, may, might like all bad movies also. And in that case, this is true, and this is true, but this is not true. But I'll have to look at what you did and see how you tried to tie Mary likes bad movies into, into those. All right, so that's also a fallacy. As a reminder, the first one was true. That was Modus Tollens. So I'll post your next homework tonight on Canvas, and it'll be number theory-ish things. Modulus hmm? yeah, things. Can we do the last one, the proof of... Oh, yeah, yeah. You did. You just got back. Okay. So prove that n is even if and only if 7n plus 4 is even. So we got two things to show. You got to show that, and you got to show that. 
you got to prove if n is even, then 7n plus 4 is even, and then you've got to prove if 7n plus 4 is even, n is even. So you had a comment? Uh, I was going to ask, because I had, I had looked around for things like this, and they said that I could prove the main statement in the contrapositive. That What's the main statement? The main statement being if um, n is even, so, or if 7n plus 4 is even, that's the first, that's the first thing, the second thing, if 7n plus 4 is odd, then n is odd as well. All right, say those again. What's the main uh, statement? If n is even, then 7n plus 4 is even. And what's the contrapositive you're trying to prove? If 7n plus 4 is odd, then n is also odd. So if this is P and Q, this is saying if P then Q, and this is saying if not Q, then not P. But I think this is the same as this. But this is the contrapositive of this. So if N equals 3, then n is an integer. If n is not an integer, then n is not equal to 3. But we have not proven if n is an integer, then n is equal to 3. And we can't prove that, obviously, because it's not true. So this is exactly the same as this. But we could try to prove this, and we could also try to prove this. Um, sorry, this, so P. If we prove this and this, then we're done. Or if we prove this and this, Proving that and that would just prove the same thing twice. So let's do if P then Q. If N is even, then 7N plus 4 is even. How do we go about that? N plus. You could. N plus 6, N plus 4. Which is equal to n plus uh, two times three n plus two. That. And n is odd or even. Right. So if it is odd, we're gonna get we're gonna show that it's uh, if it is even, it's gonna be two k. So n equals 2k? Where k is an integer. Where k is an integer. Alright. Then 7n plus 4 is going to be equal to 2 times k plus. No, all together. 2 times all together, k plus. 3m plus 2 in parentheses. Mm -hmm. Then we can solve so, that part at equal to 2k k. plus 2 times 3n plus 2. And then you fold out the 2. Yeah. And if you kind of look at the stuff in the parentheses, you were just say swap that bit out for a variable, you'd see that you're of the form 2 variable or 2 stuff, which Put this back where we started with the assumption that n equals 2k. See what I mean there? In the right. very last statement, we've got two parentheses k plus 6n mm -hmm. plus 2. And if you change that down to just 2 and a variable, the mm -hmm. stuff inside is just a variable, we're back at the n equals 2k form. So we know that that's even. That's okay. Even. So if n is even, then we've shown 7n plus 4 is even. <coughs> Then we go all the steps from back to, to the 
beginning and we prove uh, the other side. But we don't know that we can express 7n plus 4 in this form. If it's even, we just know it's 2 times something. Which means it's even. Because we, uh, 6n by the 6 times 2k. So if 7n plus 4 is even, then 7n plus 4 equals 2 times something. Five so it's going to be use k. Now where do we go from there? We could just start applying algebra at that point. Subtract 1 from that side. So 7n is 2k minus 4. We can then factor out the 2. Okay. So 7n is even. Yeah. So how do we show that n is even from there? n is 2k. No, we don't know that n is 2k. Oh, okay. If we can show that, then we're done. So this direction will work well by contradiction. It's harder to do this direction with an indirect, with a direct proof, though. But we can try to show the contrapositive of this, which is equivalent to it. So then you can say that an even number is the form 2k plus 1. So, Let's say, so for example, we have the statement that if n is even, n is equal to 2k, where n and k are both in or if n is odd, n is equal to 2k plus 1, where n and k are measures. Right. So what we can try to do with that is prove, and let me get rid of this. And I'm going to do a different version of this in a second. But we want to prove if 7n plus 4 is even, suffice to prove the contrapositive. If n is odd, then 7n plus 4 is odd. So we say that n is equal to k plus 1 for odd, but it's not a number, where n and k are both integers. Okay, so n equals 2k plus 1, where n and k are integers, that's the definition of an odd. Then we substitute n plus 7 plus 4 for 2k plus 1. Alright, so... Distribute the 7 over the 2k and the 1 to get 14k plus 11 when you add them all together. That's of the form 2 times 7k plus 5 plus 1, which is 2 stuff. So if you switch it around with the contrapositive, a direct proof works really well. Since n is odd, it has this form, and if you plug that in, you can show that this has this form, which means it's odd. And we can actually do the same style for that original proof without having to do the factoring and breaking it down, which I think might be a way to show this directly. But, um, but that first proof, Prove if n is even, then 7n plus 4 is even. If we just say n equals 2k, then 7n plus 4 equals 7 times 2k plus 4, 14k plus 4, 2 times 7k plus 2 equals 2l, and that's got to be even. Talking question? Uh, yeah, it's about number two. I 
found how to uh, prove that by two tables. Okay. If it's possible, or I think it's possible. Why is it so hard to prove that by like something like this way? Yeah, I believe you can, but yes, it's a lot easier with a truth table. Um. Trying to show that those are logically equivalent. Um, did you try it? I tried. How far did you get? I did something, I'm not sure if I did right. Okay. It's on my paper. Okay. I'll look at it, I'll let you know. Um, you should be able to kind of go crazy with De Morgan's theorem. And, yeah. And Two times De Morgan on one time. Yeah. I'll look at it and, and see what you did and give you feedback. Did anybody else try to do this with way other than a truth table? Oh, no. Truth table. Okay. Did you? Yeah, I did. Did it work? Uh, I think so, but I think uh, it kind of just felt like I was saying it's true because it is. Uh -huh. Like, I couldn't really tell if I displayed anything meaningful. Okay. <laughs> I'll check that and, and we can talk about it tomorrow. See what you did. Yeah. I wrote like a sentence and definitely think it's wrong now. Okay. But, uh, I just said it was a bi-conditional bi once it's in the table and book. I said that's a commonly accepted. That's probably true. I'd like to point out that in the scientific discipline, citing a trusted resource is a sufficient answer. To <laughs> this is true. <laughs> but we're not talking such a now. This is true also. This is this is like turning in the dictionary for your essay. Uh, here you go. I scrambled it Somewhere up for you. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it is it is an accepted equivalence. Um, so, but but there are different ways to go about actually showing it to be true. Um, well, I'll see what you did, and I'll look at truth table solutions. We'll talk about it tomorrow. <coughs> I don't think I've actually done that one. All right, we were talking about primes. We ended up by talking about unique factorization, which was this wonderful fact that if you take some arbitrary number. You can break it into a product of prime numbers, and the set of primes and the number of times each prime occurs is unique. Obviously, I could also write this as 7 times 13 times 11, but that's not really writing it differently. So if you ignore reordering, the factorization is unique. And that gives us all kinds of, of wonderful properties of primes that we'll use later. Um, so questions about primes. We know you need factorization. We can generate, um, we can test a number to see if it's prime by just seeing if anything divides it. So 1,001, you just start dividing by possible numbers, and if you find something, it's not prime. If you get all the way up to 1,000 and you haven't found a factor, it's, it's prime. How far do you need to check for possible divisors, though? This is square root. Yeah, actually less than or equal to the square root is enough, because if p divided by x is equal to a, then p equals a times x, and this is equal to the square root of p times the square root of p. If this is less than square root of p, this has got to be greater than square root of p, and vice versa. And they could both be equal, like 49 is 7 times 7. So you have to check the square root and all numbers below that. But it's a whole lot smaller set than testing up to, say, half or to the number minus 1. So that's one way to check a number to see if it's prime. There's ways to generate primes. Here's a really old system called the sieve of Aristosthenes. It uses a hell of a lot of memory. It does. So start with your first number, circle it, and then cross off every second number. Bang, 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 bang. 
circle your next number, cross off every third number. 6, 9, 12, 15, 18. Circle your next number, cross off every fifth number, 10, 15, 20, and continue. 7, cross off every seventh number, 11, cross off every eleventh number, and what you're left with are prime numbers. All prime numbers up to that point. So the Greeks did this, I don't know what else Aristosthenes did, but, but this is named after Aristosthenes. Um, and when I first started teaching 120, I bought myself a Lego kit, and I was going to make a little bot that would do this. And I never found the time to do it, but I think that would be a cool little project. Just have it go around and put numbers on paper, and then have it go back and count them and mark them off in the sieve. And when it's done, you've got prime numbers. But there's no general formula for, for producing prime numbers. There's no machine you can put uh, turn the crank and it spits out prime numbers that we know of. There may be such a thing, but we don't have one. And we certainly don't have a way to say, give me the 15 billionth prime number and plug it into a formula and get whatever that number is. Short of finding the just 15 billion. Short of working your way up there, right? I'd just like to point out that if you do manage to find one such machine, that knowledge would be worth billions of yes. dollars. Yes. Which you, you would probably be killed broken. before you had a chance to do anything with it. <laughs> yes, you would have effectively broken all of today's modern encryption software. Definitely. So you'd probably get a good neighbor check from, from no such agency. <laughs> <laughs> But there are ways to find things that might be prime that are pretty big. And Guinness Book of World Records always lists the largest known prime number. And, and whenever anybody discovers a new one, it's usually written up like in the science section of the New York Times or something like that. But they aren't finding the next prime number beyond the largest number that we know. They're looking for a particular type of prime called a Mersenne prime, which I think I misspelled. But it's a prime in the form 2 to the p minus 1, where p is a prime number itself. So for example, 2 squared minus 1 is 3, that's a prime. <coughs> 2 cubed minus 1 is 7, that's a prime. 2 to the fifth minus 1 is 31, that's a prime. 2 to the 7th minus 1 is 127. That's a prime. I don't remember if that one's a prime or not. But you pretty quickly find that not all numbers of this form, this is not, this is 23 times 89. It's a pretty nice prime. It's two big primes multiplied together, but it's not prime. So you pretty quickly realize that not every number in this form is a prime, but a lot of them are. And if Q is composite, this is not prime. So 2 to the 4th minus 1 is 15. That's not prime. 2 to the 6th minus 1 is 63. That's not prime. 2 to the 8th minus 1 is 255. That's not prime. But if P is prime, this may be a prime, and if it is, it's called a Mersenne prime. And this is the form of the really big prime numbers that we see written up in the paper from time to time. Well, what's special about Mersenne prime, though? Um, they're a popular version of a prime number to try to generate. Because a lot of work has been done, I think this goes back to the 17 or the 1800s, I don't remember which. And testing whether or not this is prime is fairly efficient. There's something called the Lucas-Lemur test. And computationally, it's a really efficient algorithm. And the prime numbers that we deal with now, they're, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of digits or more. Um, the largest one I knew when I was a kid was this. And that was like 6,004 digits, I think. But they've gone way beyond that. But there's these simple tests you can use to tell whether or not that's prime. 6,004 digits, that's a lot of numbers. The square root of that has a lot of digits. There's no way you can divide by every number up to the square root.
but there's other tests you can do if your number is in this form. So like using the program that most of us made in 121, mm -hmm. we wouldn't be able to generate things like that because mm -hmm. no, not enough that. time. Um, you can extend your program to work with with numbers that are this big, and we actually do that in, in one of the other classes. Um, but there's just not enough time in the expected life of the universe. But can we have enough bits to even do that? Yeah, you can do that. That only takes 20,000 bits to store this number. All right, to the 19,000 has 19,000 bits. Yeah, we can play a thing that's 2 raised to the 19937 minus 1 is infinity. Yeah, for, for our calculators. <laughs> like all of them are generated on nothing more than your average desktop computer. <laughs> yes, so there's this thing called GIMP. Seriously? Yes. Yes. Uh, Is it stealing my processing power with GIMP? Yeah. Great internet mercy. Yeah, I have to go back and paint that net. <laughs> and you can download a program that when your computer is idle, instead of doing a screensaver, it'll look for prime numbers. And it talks to the mothership and it says, check this number, and it runs a Lucas Lemur test and figures out whether or not two to that prime minus one is prime. And if it is or not, it reports back and the hunt continues. And if you've got millions of PCs sitting around idle, you've got, you know, a million core CPU chowing away on this problem. So a lot of the, um, the prime numbers we found are done by this game punch. Anybody ever heard of SETI at home? SETI at home, yeah, same, same thing. Same thing. Mm -hmm. um, pick up signals from deep space and look for patterns that correspond to signatures from certain molecules that we associate with organic life. And it's just a lot of data to plow through, and we can't do it fast enough. But if you spread this out over multiple machines, so same thing, you put this on your PC, and instead of a screensaver, it gets a signal from SETI and it runs this analysis on it, and if it looks like it might be a hit, it sends a message back to SETI and then they go and do deeper analysis on that it. It makes more screen saver too. Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> shows you like the spectrum or something. Full um, home shows you the stuff. No one has a supercomputer sitting around generating prime numbers? There probably are supercomputers doing this, and they make good benchmark programs to tell how fast a computer is. Um, but there's a whole lot more processing power just in people's spare cycles because everybody has PCs that they're not using, not everybody, but in the U.S. a lot of people <coughs> have these spare cycles available. Um, there's a protein folding at home application. Folding proteins is one of these combinatorially explosive problems. And if you know how to fold proteins in certain ways, it can be really powerful in terms of drug discovery or detecting markers for certain kinds of diseases. And so you can use your spare cycles in that effort as well. You can also make money off of this with uh, Bitcoin. Bitcoin mining. <laughs> so Bitcoin, right, digital currency, in order to produce this currency, you need to find prime numbers. Mm -hmm. and, and well, you need to find random numbers. Oddities you like that. To, you need to hash. Give, given a string, you need to find a hash that has a certain number of zeros for the start. Okay. So hashing lots of things. Yeah. Yeah, we're going we're gonna to talk about hashing and how it ties into prime numbers later on. Um, so you, you can do that, but, but you don't just give that away because you actually make money off of that. Because <laughs> people need these, this information. Um, and people build custom hardware. You can get things that will configure an FPGA for you to do Bitcoin mining if your CPU is not fast enough. It's a crazy world. I mean, the cloud is kind of all around us in this way. Um, but primes are, are a big source of, of uh, CPU consumption. Um, we know that there's an infinite number of primes. We don't know if there's an infinite number of primes <coughs> that come in these pairs where they're separated by two. We think there are, but we don't know. Nobody has a proof. Well, I think there are. I don't know what other people think. Couldn't we prove that similarly to how we prove that there's an infinite number of primes? You can try. I but have a feeling somebody already tried. Give it a try, though. A lot of this stuff is done by people who are not mathematicians per se, right? Because if the mathematical community works on something for 100 years and doesn't find a solution,
it may be it takes someone with a different perspective. Like playing chess. Like playing chess. So, um, right, do you all know how to solve this equation? Or you knew at one time how to solve this equation, <laughs> right? There's a formula, x equals negative b plus or minus the square root, right? Um, and you can plug in a, b, and c, and out come the roots. And this is also true for a third degree equation. There's a bigger formula for solving cubics, and there's an even bigger formula for solving fourth degree equations. <coughs> yeah. But nobody ever found a way to solve a fifth degree equation. They proven And it was it was actually proven that you can't, and it was proven by an eighteen year old named Galois who repeatedly tried to get into school and was denied. He spent some time in jail. He had this really tragic life. He had no formal training in mathematics, but he created this whole branch of mathematics that nobody understood at the time because it was such a radically different direction from what people were doing. And he would send his manuscript somewhere, and they would be like, rubbish, you know? <laughs> and, and he died in a duel at 18 over an argument. And he spent the night before basically pulling an all-nighter. He was writing all his ideas down, so he didn't sleep. And he probably would have died anyway, but he got shot in this duel and died a few days later. Um, but he was so out of the mainstream that what he was doing was brilliant. But it was a number of decades before people eventually started to understand what he had written down that night before he died and realized this is brilliant mathematics. So when you have an insight, like maybe there's a way to do this impossible thing this way, go ahead and do it, you know? And even if someone tells you that it's impossible, even if I've told you you can't answer the continuum hypothesis, if you think you can, go for it. Because I, I mean, it was impossible to fly, right? You could not have an object heavier than air, denser than air that would float. So flight was impossible. Um, we break through these things all the time. Um, another open question is Goldbach's conjecture. Which says the following. sum of two primes. And Goldbach's conjecture is that you can always do this. For any even number bigger than two, two would be one plus one, and we don't count one as prime, but that I can pick any even number and I can write it as a sum of two primes. I mean, wasn't it proven that you could write any um, fundamental theorem of algebra? So doesn't mm -hmm. that kind of extend to a sum instead of using multiplication to make it happen? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like a potential insight, um, but nobody has been able to prove this, and nobody has found a counter I see the catch. It's only two. How two, how primes. Even... two primes. So that's the catch. Yeah. So that's an open question. Again, really easy to explain, apparently really difficult to prove if it's true. And this has been checked numerically and to the limits of our computational power, we have not found a counterexample. But still no proof. Usually if something's true, there's a way to prove it, you would think. So that's an open question. And I think the first class we talked about the most famous formally open question for Fermat's last theorem, which is can you solve this equation in positive integers when n is bigger than 2? And the final answer in the 90s was no, you can't do it. But it took a lot of effort to prove that. And there were a lot of attempts to prove it that were wrong. And in some cases, those failed attempts to prove it opened up wholly new branches of mathematics as people tried to restore the integrity of their proof. One of these proofs dealt with 
a different kind of algebra, and they assumed you could factor things uniquely into primes. And it turned out you couldn't in this particular version. But assuming you had unique factorization over this other algebra, somebody proved Fermat's last theorem. And sometime later, someone said, no, you made this assumption, and it's not true in the algebra you created. And then this person spent some time trying to fix that up by restoring the factorization. And it led to a branch of mathematics called ideal theory. And these problems are interesting because they drive a lot of development and a lot of research. Even though there may be no practical application for knowing if you can solve this or not, it's an interesting, uh, it's a fertile ground which should develop other ideas. All right, I believe the, talk, the book talks about something called the Chinese Remainder Theorem. I'm going to ask you to read that, but I'm not going to go over it. But just glance through it. I won't question you on it. Well, I might ask you what the Chinese Remainder Theorem says. But, um, but it's basically dealing with how you solve multiple equations with congruences. So we can solve simultaneous equations algebraically. But if we have equations of congruences, like x is congruent to 2 mod 3, and x is congruent to 3 mod 5, and x is congruent to 2 mod 7, can we find a number x that satisfies all three of these equations? And it turns out you can. And you can do it using this thing called the Chinese Remainder Theorem. And it's an algorithm you can apply, and I don't want to go through the details of it here, because I don't think I can add a lot of insight from that. But under certain conditions, certain properties that these equations have, we can say, yes, there is a solution, and we can use the algorithm, use this algorithm to find what the solution is. And that'll be helpful for cryptography. So one theorem I do want to talk about in some detail is Fermat's little theorem. Kind of a meaning title. Theorem. I'm guessing his last theorem is the non-little theorem, I don't know. Despite his elegant proof argument. Yeah, but it's the same initial, it's still FLT, so I don't know. If P is prime, and P does not divide A, then a to the p minus 1 is congruent to 1 modulo p. That's for all of A. <coughs> so pick a prime number, pick an A that p does not divide, so it's not a multiple. A to the p minus 1 will be congruent to 1 mod p. So for example, if we wanted to find 7 to the 221st power modulo 11, On a calculator, we probably can't do this. I think 7 to the 221st will blow up. And we don't want to do this by hand, because multiplying 7 by itself 220 times is a lot of work. <coughs> but if we keep in mind Fermat's little theorem, we can set p equal to 11. That's a prime number. We can set a equal to 7, and 11 does not divide 7. And so by Fermat's little theorem, we know that 7 raised to the 10th is congruent to 1, modulo 11. And I think you can do that on a calculator and confirm it. What does that have to do with 7 to the 
Well, if 7 to the 10th is congruent to 1, 7 to the 20th, which is 7 to the 10th squared, is congruent to 1 squared, which is also congruent to 1. And in fact, 7 to the 22 times 10 is going to be congruent to 1. And so 7 to the 220th is congruent to 1 mod 11. And so 7 to the 221st is congruent to 1 times 7 modulo 11. Because 7 to the 21st is 7 to the 220th times 7. And 1 times 7 is just 7. So it makes that kind of operation a prime number to a large prime number. No, not prime. Doesn't to have large, to be prime, to be but to prime. a large exponent, we can calculate these. Modulus. Modulus. A prime number. Yeah. And this doesn't actually have to be prime, it just can't be a multiple of 11. So we seven? could have done 5. You mean a 7? Yeah, the 7. So we could have done 6 to the 221st. So we can start to do large exponentiation very efficiently by doing tricks like Fermat's level theorem. And to do encryption and decryption with public key systems, we need to do large exponentiation. We need to raise things to ridiculously big powers. So that's one trick we can use. The other is something that we're just going to call um, modular exponentiation. And I'll talk about how to do that tomorrow. And then we'll start talking about applications. And we may not get to encryption, decryption until <coughs> Monday. Um, we'll see what we get through tomorrow. But we've got time. So cryptography either tomorrow or uh, Monday. All right, I'll look at your homework tonight. I'll post next homework. Thank you.